All right, well, let's turn in our Bibles to Luke chapter 12. And let's talk about the end of the world. This is the last message in this little series in a series that we've been doing on the end times as a part of God came near. Now let's just say that we knew that Jesus was coming back at three o'clock in the afternoon. Now, of course, we will never know that, but just for the sake of an illustration, if you knew, if I knew, if we all knew three o'clock this afternoon, Jesus Christ is coming back. First of all, we want to make sure our clocks are right because we don't want to miss this one. I'm sure we'd all be like saints at 245. We'd be wearing our Sunday morning smiles and our come quickly Jesus attitude. But the fact is, we don't know when Jesus is returning. But why don't we have that same smile anyway at 245? Listen, we should live every day as though it were the day Christ could come. Because we don't want to know when that day is. We should live every day as though it were our last day on earth. Someone once asked the great evangelist D.L. Moody, uh, if you knew the Lord would return tonight, how would you spend the rest of the day? Moody, without hesitation, replied, I wouldn't do anything different than I do every other day. And that should be true of us. We should always be living in anticipation of the Lord's return. It's very clear in Scripture that Christ is coming back. In fact, of the 260 chapters in the New Testament, Christ's return is mentioned no less than 318 times. In John 14, Jesus said, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, you may be also. Statistically, one verse in every 25 in the Bible mentions the return of Jesus Christ. Now, I came to Christ back in 1970 uh, during the Jesus movement. It was regarded by many, now looking back uh, uh, as historically, as a genuine revival. I didn't know I'd come to Christ in a revival. I just thought that's what church always was like. Uh, but it was exciting. There were just people everywhere coming to faith. And it was a wonderful time. A lot of significant things happened during the Jesus movement. Uh, contemporary Christian Worship was effectively born. Contemporary Christian music was effectively born in that time. But a lot of us believed Jesus was coming back back then. Uh, I even designed, I was a graphic artist before I was a preacher, I even designed a Jesus is coming bumper sticker. And uh, you would see a lot of those on cars and VW vans. Of course, it was early 70s, understand, uh, before they cost so much now. <laughs> now they're collectible, then that they were just, you know, everywhere. But uh, we believe Jesus was coming back because we had seen a lot of interesting developments in our world. And uh, we prayed Jesus would come back. Well, he didn't come back. And sometimes we might look at something like that and say, well, maybe Jesus is late. Maybe Jesus missed his appointment. Not at all. Here's what scripture says, 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. He's patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but wanting everyone to come to repentance. So it's not that the Lord is late. It's that the Lord is waiting for more people to believe in him. He's waiting for that last person, if you will. Now let me take a quick poll. How many of you have become a Christian since 1970? Raise your hand. See, aren't you glad God didn't answer my prayer? You'd have been in a miserable place right now, probably. But uh, God is waiting, but in that appointed moment, he will come again. We have his word on it. Now following that statement I just gave from 2 Peter, where God is waiting for people to come to repentance, it goes on to say this, 2 Peter 3.10, the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly Lives. So, dear friends, since you're looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless and blameless and at peace with Him. That's how we're to live. So in light of the fact that Christ could come back at any time, you and I should be living holy and godly lives that we might be found spotless and blameless and at peace 
with him. You know, whenever you announce a series on the end times, people, people get really excited. You know, because they love to hear about Armageddon and the Antichrist and the Great Tribulation period and the Rapture and all that exciting stuff. But sometimes I think miss, people miss the point. Because if I study Bible prophecy and it doesn't impact me in the way that I live as a Christian, then I'm completely not getting what God is trying to say. Reminds me of an old guy that was walking down the street once and he heard a voice say to him, Pick me up and kiss me, and I'll become a beautiful princess. Now, who said that? He's looking around. Again, the voice says, pick me up and kiss me, and I'll become a beautiful princess. He's still looking. Where's that voice coming from? For the third time, he hears it. Pick me up and kiss me. I'll become a beautiful princess. And it was a frog that said it. This is a true story. <laughs> so he reaches down and picks up the frog and looks at it. And for the fourth time, the frog says, Kiss me and I'll become a beautiful princess. He looked at it and smiled and put the frog in his pocket and his shirt and sort of patted it and started walking again. The frog said, didn't you hear what I said? I said, kiss me and I'll become a beautiful princess. The old guy said, at my age, I'd rather have a talking frog. <laughs> Boy, talk about missing the point. And we can miss the point too. All around us are signs of the times that Christ is coming back. I would include the recent Supreme Court ruling among those signs. In addition to the rise in terrorism and the unrest in the world. Do you remember back in 2012, this Mayan calendar predicted that was the end of the world? A lot of people got worked up about that. I made the bold prediction it wasn't true. How daring that was of me. Of course, I know what the Bible says. I knew that wasn't it. But someone came up with kind of a humorous list of things to do before the end of the world. Uh, things you should do when you know the world is ending. Here's some of them. Uh, number one, you know the world's ending. End your diet immediately. <laughs> number two, park wherever and however you want. Thirdly, resolve to hit the gym tomorrow. Uh, listen to It's the End of the World by R.E.M. Throw out your bucket list. Make a lot of noise in the library. These are supposed to be funny, by the way. I'm not. <laughs> You're sort of my guinea pig service. Now, if you don't like this stuff, it's not making it to second and third, okay? <laughs> I'm going to keep going. I'm desperate. You only laughed at one. Okay, you know the world's ending tomorrow, right? Order 4,500 pizza, pizza. See, I can't even deliver the lines. <laughs> Maybe if I deliver the lines right, it would be funny. Start over again. Order 4,500 pizzas and give one to every stranger you meet. Okay. Okay, wait, I, I, I've, it's gonna get better. It's gonna end good. <laughs> Find a Twinkie. They're ending, you're ending. The symmetry is perfect. Okay, one last one. You know the world is ending. Leave the toilet seat up. <laughs> That's it? Okay. Next service, I'll just use that one joke. Whoa, tough crowd here. All right, let's look at Luke chapter 12. Here's what Jesus tells us we should be doing. And by the way, the title of my message is Things to Do Before the End of the World. Jesus says, be dressed, by the way, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Be dressed and ready for service and keep your lamps burning. As though you were waiting for your master to return from the wedding feast, then you will be ready to open the door and let him in the moment he arrives and knocks. The servants who are ready and waiting for his return will be rewarded. I tell you the truth, he himself will seat them and put on an apron and serve them as they sit and eat. He may come in the middle of the night or just before dawn, but whenever he comes, he will reward the servants who are ready. Understand this, if a homeowner knew exactly when a burglar was coming, he would not permit his house to be broken into. You must also be ready all of the time for the Son of Man will come when you least expect him. Peter asked him, Lord, is this illustration just for us or is it for everyone? 
And the Lord replied, a faithful and sensible servant is the one to whom the master can give the responsibility of managing his other household servants and feeding them. If the master returns and finds that servant has done a good job, there'll be a reward. I tell you the truth, the master will put that servant in charge of all that he owns. But if that servant thinks, oh, my master won't be back for a while, and begins beating the other servants, partying and getting drunk, the master will return unannounced and unexpected and cut that servant in pieces and banish him with the unfaithful. And a servant who knows what the master wants but isn't prepared and doesn't carry out those instructions will be severely punished. But someone who does not know and then does something wrong will only be punished lightly. When someone has been given much, much will be required in return. And when someone has been entrusted with much, even more will be required. Now these words of our Lord would be readily understood in the time in which, which he was speaking. Jesus was describing a classic first century wedding. Now in the Jewish cultures, weddings would go on for days, not just hours as they do in our culture. It was a great thing to be invited to a big wedding. There'd be a lot of celebration. There'd be a lot of fun. But sort of a unique feature of a Jewish wedding is you did not necessarily know when it would actually take place, when the ceremony would actually happen. So the groom might show up at three in the afternoon. He might show up at three in the morning. An announcement would be given. Behold, the bridegroom is coming. And if you were asleep, you'd miss it. Snooze, you lose. But if you were alert and waiting, you would be able to be a part of the ceremony. So with this concept in mind, Jesus is sort of drawing upon that and it's like he's likening it to him being the bridegroom that is returning and we too should be ready. So what do we learn from the statements of Christ? Point number one, we should be shining lights in a dark place. We should be shining lights in a dark place. Look at verse 35. Be dressed for service and keep your lamps burning. The New King James Version translate that, translates that. Let your waist be girded and your lamps burning. Now what does it mean to have your waist girded? Well, Back in those days, of course, everyone wore these long flowing ropes. And so when you wanted to move quickly, you would sort of hike your robe up above your knees and cinch in your belt. That's what it meant to gird yourself. And so that's the idea that Jesus is giving. So if we were to put it into the modern vernacular, it's trying to communicate the idea of be ready to go at a moment's notice. It would be like saying, have gas in your car. I don't know why, but my wife does not like to put gas in her car. I took her car out the other day. She's like on the bottom of red. I'm like, And of course, I'm late for something I have to do. And now I have to stop and get the gas. You know, so have your car gassed up. Have your cell phone charged. Have fresh batteries in your flashlight. The idea is be ready to go in a moment's notice. That's how every believer should live. We should always be ready. If it's today, I'm ready. If it's a month from now, I'm ready. If it's later, I'm ready. But I'm prepared. Another thing, he says, is that we should be having our lamps burning. Uh, Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. It seems to me, as culture gets darker, that we as Christians need to shine brighter. And things are dark. And in some ways, you can see the brightness of light more in a dark place, right? Ever go in the movie theater? Now they have this thing ahead of this uh, movie, you know, don't use your cell phone. Don't text. And someone always texts. And they're always sitting in front of me. And you just can't help it. You're looking at the screen. They pull out their phone. They're, you know, checking something or updating their Instagram or whatever they're doing. And your eye is drawn to that light. Even though you're in this massive place, that light shines brightly. That's how we are to be in this place we're living in now. As things get darker, we need to shine even more brightly. Now, I want you to notice that Jesus is pointing out, even if the Lord returns later than you expected, you should not be disappointed, but you should still be in a state of readiness. Look at verse 38. He may come in the middle of the night or just before dawn, but whenever he comes, he'll reward the servants who are ready. 
Jesus is saying, even if I come later than you expected, be ready. Remember the story of when the disciples were out on the Sea of Galilee? Jesus said, dispatch them to the other side. As they're making their way across, the scripture tells us a great storm came and there were overhead waves and the disciples were wondering if they were even gonna survive this journey. But we're also told that Jesus went up into a mountain to pray. And no doubt he was praying for them. They couldn't see him, but he could see them. He had a watchful eye on his boys as, they're made, as they made their way across. And then Matthew's Gospel tells us, in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus came to them. So they're just freaking out. They've been at sea for up to nine hours, battling against these waves, trying to get to shore, and along comes Jesus walking on the water. Understand, these are waves, so he's kind of going up over the waves and just kind of, whoa, walking through it all. See, when you're God, you can walk anywhere you want. And they see him walking toward him, and they freak out first thinking he's a ghost, but it's Jesus, and they invite him on board. But the point of it is, he came to them in the fourth watch of the night. The fourth watch of the night in the Hebrew calendar was the time just before dawn. And the point is this, sometimes God comes later than we expected, but that doesn't necessarily mean he's late. Remember the story of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus? They were close friends of our Lord. Whenever Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, he'd stop at their home in Bethany for a killer meal. Martha was an amazing cook and uh, one day his friend Lazarus got sick. And so they just sent word to Jesus, Lord, your friend Lazarus is sick. Now, being personal friends of Christ, and that would be hard to not drop in a conversation, wouldn't it? Well, as I was saying to Jesus Christ the other day, when he was in our front room and enjoying my falafels that I made, or as Jesus said to me just recently, I mean, they really were friends of our Lord. Tell the Lord that his friend Lazarus is sick. And when Jesus heard that, we're told in scripture, he stayed a few more days where he was. And then it adds this point, Jesus loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. So effectively they say, tell Jesus, thinking he'll speak the word, Lazarus will be healed. Or he'll return quickly and lay his hand on Lazarus and raise him up again. But not only does Jesus not do that, he hangs out where he was a little bit longer. And by the time he arrives, Lazarus isn't sick anymore. Lazarus is dead. In fact, Lazarus has been dead for three days. And Martha runs up to the Lord and says, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. Very honest. Jesus, loose paraphrase, you blew it. We bragged on you to all our friends that you'd show up and you weren't here. It's your fault. Jesus said your brother will rise again. Of course, we know how that story ended. He resurrected Lazarus from the dead. But here's my point. Sometimes God is late, and I put that in quotes, because he wants to do something above and beyond that which you could ask or think. See, they wanted a healing. Jesus wanted a resurrection. He wanted to do more than they prayed for. By the way, how many of you have been praying at 320 every day? Oh, good. Thank you. Fantastic. If you haven't heard about this, we have an initiative we launched called 320. It's based on Ephesians 320 that says, our God is able to do abundantly above and beyond that which we could ask or think. So at 320, every day your alarm goes off. And there's no way you would remember that if we just told you. But when the alarm in your phone goes off, you just pause and pray and on our social media. We'll post a, a prayer request for the day. We're doing 31 days of prayer. But God is able to do above and beyond that which we could ask or think. Jesus wasn't late. He was right on time. But sometimes another reason the Lord doesn't come as quickly as we would like is he wants us to reach the end of ourselves. You know, it's been said when you reach the end of yourself, you get to the beginning of God. And sometimes the Lord will let us get to that place. Maybe you've lost a loved one and you don't know how you can go on another day. Or a doctor has told you that you are not going to live much longer. Your only hope is God. 
If God doesn't come through for you, there is no hope. So you cry out to him and you pray and you pray and maybe he comes on the fourth watch. But know this, he will always come in the right time and give you what you need when you need it. So you just hang in there and you just hold your course. Point number two, we are to be watching for him. We're to be watching for him. Look at verse 37. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. So we should be looking. Now that doesn't mean we should be standing on street corners, staring into the sun like a bunch of idiots. But what it does mean is we should be aware of the fact that Christ is coming. And as we read our Bibles and as we watch the news and see developments. Those are reminders that his coming is near. And then of course, we are to be ready to go. I already touched on this point. It's effectively having your bags packed, ready to leave at a moment's notice. And another way to be ready to go is to ask yourself the question, this place that I'm about to go, this thing that I'm going to go do, would I be ashamed or embarrassed to be doing such a thing if Jesus were to come back? So think about your plans for this afternoon. Is there anything you're gonna do? Is there any place you're gonna go where you would be embarrassed to be if Christ were to come back? If so, I would encourage you to change your plans because as I said earlier, if we really understand what the Bible says when it says he is returning, it should cause us to live godly lives. First John 3 says we know when Christ is revealed, we will be like him, we'll see him as he is. Everyone that has this hope purifies himself even as he is pure. So our desire should be to become more like Jesus each and every day as we await his return. Point number four, I should not only be ready, but I should be anxiously awaiting his return. I should not only be ready, but I should be anxiously awaiting his return. Look at verse 36 for a moment. You should be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding, then when he comes, they'll open to him immediately. That's the idea, open to him immediately. I used to have a dog, and he would sleep against my door at night. I didn't, I didn't like him sleeping in my room. I know some people let their dogs sleep in their beds, whatever, you know, that's fine, but I didn't like it. For one reason, this dog would have nightmares, and I don't know what he was having nightmares about, but he'd be, <laughs> you know, I, I, I can't sleep with this dog around. So I'd put him outside of my door. He would lean up against my door. Sometimes when he would scratch himself, he'd go <laughs> in the middle of the night. I'm jumping, uh, uh, someone's at my door. They're knocking at my bedroom door. Well, he, he was so close to the door because he was waiting for me to wake up. And I would open the door in the morning and the dog would come rolling in. <laughs> And then he would go round in circles, round in circles, round in circles. He's so happy because he's going to go on a walk, right? That's how we ought to be. When we think of the Lord's return, just sort of leaning there, just excited in anticipation of it. Uh, we can learn a few lessons from dogs, I guess. I saw a bumper sticker that made me chuckle. It said, Lord, make me the person my dog thinks I am. I like that. I've never seen one that says, make me the person my cat thinks I am. Because <laughs> you know what, your cat, they never think of you. <laughs> and we can learn from dogs, not everything. I don't advocate drinking toilet water. But um, they're excited when their master appears. We should be the same way. Have you ever had someone come to visit you you haven't seen in a long time? Maybe it's a member of your family, so you're very excited to see them. Uh, or it's a close friend you haven't talked with for a while, so they're coming to your house and you're kind of looking through the window and they pull their car up and they get out of the car and they're walking up to the door and they're ready to knock. And you open the door before they can even knock, right? and you throw your arms around him and you hug him, you can hardly wait for them to come. That's how we ought to be while we're waiting for Christ. We can hardly wait. We look forward to that moment. Jesus says, behold, I come quickly. The answer of the true Christian 
should always be along with the Apostle John. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Number five, we're not only to be anxiously waiting, don't miss this one, but we are also to be working. We're not just waiting, we're working. Look at verse 43. Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Remember a while back this crazy guy predicted Christ was coming back at a certain time. And unbelievably, a lot of people believed it. And the thing that I found fascinating was a lot of people were quitting their jobs. And some were even divorcing their spouses, which I thought was very curious. Those are not things we should be doing as we await the Lord's return. We shouldn't be quitting. We should be working. And we should be about our master's business. You see, if watching is the evidence of faith, working is the evidence of faith in action. Watching for the Lord's return will help us prepare our own lives, but working will assure we bring others with us. And know this, there is a special blessedness in living this way. Remember in Revelation, there's a blessing promised to the person that reads, hears, and keeps the words of that book. And I think what's true of Revelation is true of the subject of the Lord's return. There's a blessing attached to it. And by the way, the word blessing is interchangeable with the word happy. So you could translate verse 37, happy are those servants whom the master when he comes will find watching. Or literally, how happy are those servants? See, it's not a miserable, repressive, confining way to live, looking for the return of Christ. It's the very opposite of that. It's a joyful thing. Uh, C.H. Spurgeon said, quote, it's a very blessed thing to be on the watch for Christ. It's a blessing for us now. It detaches you from the world so you can be poor without murmuring. You can be rich without worldliness. You can be sick without sorrowing. You can be healthy without presumption. If you are always waiting for Christ's coming, untold blessings are wrapped up in that glorious hope, end quote. Well said. Now, let's turn the camera a different way. We've been looking at the believer who's ready. Now look at this person. Uh, this person who's watching, but is not really prepared. Uh, verse 45 of Luke 12. But of that servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming. It begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and be drunk. The master of that servant will come in a day, come in a day when he is not looking for him. Now, this is either a picture of a person who thinks they're a Christian but isn't, or it's a picture of someone who is a Christian but they're a compromised one. But whatever the case, this is not the right way to be living as you anticipate the Lord's return. Verse 45, if he says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming. See, so by saying master, he would look like a fellow servant. So this to me seems to be not a person outside the church, but a person inside the church. A person inside the church who has somehow got a hardened heart. You want to know the easiest place to have your heart hardened? You say, bar, nightclub? No. The easiest place to get a hardened heart is where you are right now. The easiest place to get a heart that is hard against God is in the church. In fact, I'll take it a step further. Church is a dangerous place. You say, dangerous? Greg, I thought this was the safest place around. Well, it all depends. For the believer who is coming to worship God, it's the safest and best of places. It's a spiritual oasis where we worship and we pray and we learn and we love. But for the non-believer who's playing games with God, church is a dangerous place because it's here we can get our hearts irreparably hardened. It's been said the same sun that softens the wax hardens the clay. The same message that transforms one life can cause another to say, I don't believe. So if you go to church week after week, month after month, year after year, with no intention of applying the truth in your life, your heart can get hard. So here's my advice to you. If that's your attitude, I wouldn't keep coming to church. You might be surprised to hear me say that. If you're here under duress, if you're here under pressure, I'm going to make one exception if you're 
a young person and your parents brought you, you come. I don't care. You, you, you should be brought here. I remember hearing uh, Billy Graham's brother, who's in heaven now, Mel, say that uh, when he was a kid, he had a drug problem. I was very surprised. I said, Mel, you had a drug problem? He said, yes. My parents drug me to church on Sunday morning. They drug me to church Wednesday night. And they drug me to, yeah, I like that. A drug problem. So I think we want to bring our kids to church if they want to come or not. But as we get older and it's our own decision and you keep coming and I don't know what reason you come. I don't know why you're here today. I would assume at this hour you're here because you want to be closer to God. But if for some reason you're here with no desire to change, no interest in applying these truths in your life, this can be a bad place for you because your heart can actually start to get hard. The solution is not eliminating church. The solution is changing your heart, isn't it? Because you see, the problem is, is we as believers can harden our heart against God. It's to Christians that the author of Hebrews writes, these words in Hebrews 12, excuse me, Hebrews 3, 12. Be careful, brothers. Make sure that your own hearts are not evil and unbelieving, churning you away from the living God. We must warn each other every day, as long as it's called today, so none of you are deceived by sin and hardened against God. See, there can be people that say they're a Christian, but they're living a godless lifestyle. They say they're a Christian, but... They're having premarital sex. They say they're a Christian, but they're having an affair, if you want to call it that. The Bible calls it adultery. They say they're a Christian, but they lie to people every day and rip people off in business. They say they're a Christian, and they go out and party and get drunk. How does that work? That it works when you have a hard heart. Because look at what Christ says, actually, focuses on that very thing. Verse 45, if my servant thinks my master won't be back for a while, begins beating the other servants and partying and getting drunk. The master will return unannounced and unexpected and cut the servant in pieces and banish him with the unfaithful. You know, people get drunk for a lot of reasons. People get drunk sometimes to escape their problems. They drink to forget things. And by the way, Alcohol will never make your problems better. It'll just make them worse and bring a whole new set of problems with it. I know this from experience. Uh, watching what happened in my mom's life and the lives of the people she was involved with, all who were alcoholics, and just saw how it just ruined their lives, really every one of them. And uh, this is not the way we should be living. Our minds should be clear. Our minds should be open. We should be serving the Lord. Because Jesus is coming. So let's sum it up. Number one, we should be shining lights in the dark place. Number two, we should be watching for him. Number three, we should be ready to go. Number four, we should not only be ready, but anxiously awaiting his return. Fifth and lastly, we're not only anxiously waiting, but we're also working. Now there's something else Jesus told us specifically to do as we await his return. And that is to honor him at the communion table. 1 Corinthians 11, Paul writes on what Christ said in the upper room at the Last Supper. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, this cup is a new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this to remember me. And every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, listen, you're announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. So we're to do this until Christ comes back again. What are we to do? We're to remember. Remember what? Remember what Jesus did for us on the cross. Remember his suffering. Remember his sacrifice. Remember his love that was demonstrated for us in such a tangible way. Coming back to the topic of drinking for a moment, the world drinks to forget and the Christian drinks to remember. We take of this cup not to blot things out, but to remember what Christ did for us. And then Paul goes on with some very specific warnings about communion. I told you church was a dangerous place. First Corinthians eleven twenty seven. he says, if you eat this bread or drink this cup in an unworthy manner, 
You're guilty of sinning against the body and blood of our Lord. That's why you should examine yourself before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you're eating and drinking God's judgment on yourself. Wow, heavy words. You see what that's saying? If I come to church and I receive communion without knowing the one that it represents, that's dishonoring to God, and I'm actually eating and drinking judgment to myself. Communion, the Lord's Supper, as it's also called, is for Christians only. So if you're a visitor here today and you've not yet put your faith in Christ, I would say to you respectfully, don't receive communion. But better than missing this opportunity, hey, just had a thought. Why don't you become a Christian right now? And you can receive communion with us. You say, well, what do you mean? Just become a Christian right now. Doesn't it take a little longer than that? Actually, no. Conversion doesn't take very long at all. It doesn't take years. It doesn't take months. It doesn't take weeks. It doesn't take even hours. It can happen in a moment when you put your faith in Christ. What is conversion? It's when you turn from your sin and believe that Jesus Christ is a son of God who died on the cross for you and rose again from the dead and you receive him as your savior and Lord. It's a decision to follow him. Have you made that decision yet? If not, I would like to encourage you to do it. Earlier in my message, I mentioned what the Bible says about being ready for Christ's return. It says, make every effort to be found spotless and blameless and at peace with him. Are you at peace with God right now? Or is your life in turmoil? By being at peace with God, I mean, do you know that all those things are sorted out? Like, hey, if this were my last day, I'm at peace with God. If so, you're good to go, man. But if not, let's get that resolved immediately. Say, well, what do I need to do? You need to pray and ask God to forgive you of your sin. And I'm gonna give you an opportunity to do that as we pray together, and then we're gonna receive the elements of communion. You say, well, Greg, I don't even see the communion table. Really? It's a new table we got that people of great faith can see. <laughs> Do you see it? No, it's in the back. So we're going to bring the elements forward in a moment. But if you've not asked Christ to come into your life, if you've not asked him to forgive you of your sin, if you're not at peace with God right now, if you're not sure you're ready for the Lord's return. Or listen, if you're that compromised person who's getting a hardened heart and you need to make a recommitment, respond to this invitation I give now as we pray. Let's all bow our heads. Father, thank you for your word to us. We indeed want to be ready for your return, the return of Jesus. And Lord, we want to be right with you. And I pray for any here that may not yet know you. I pray that your Holy Spirit will convict them and convince them of their sin and bring them to Jesus right now. I also pray for any people listening who may be living a compromised life. Help them, Lord, to make that much needed recommitment. We ask this in your name. And while our heads are bowed, and our eyes are closed and we're praying together. How many of you would say today, Greg, pray for me. I'm not sure if I'm at peace with God. I'm not sure if I'm ready for the Lord's return. I can't say with confidence, I know that Christ lives in me, but I want that. I want Jesus. If you want Jesus Christ to come into your life, if you want him to forgive you of your sin, if you want to go to heaven when you die, would you raise your hand up right now wherever you are and let me pray for you. Raise your hand up where I can see it. God bless you. Just lift your hand up. I'll pray for you. You want Christ to come into your life. God bless you. And God bless you. Anybody else? Just raise your hand up really high where I can see it, please. God bless you. Anyone else? You want his forgiveness. You want to know with certainty that you're ready for his return. God bless you there in the back. Anybody else? Raise your hand up. God bless you. God bless you. When our heads are still bowed, maybe some of you would say, I am the compromised person. I am getting a hardened heart in church and it's scaring me. I want to make a recommitment to Jesus right now. If that's you, would you raise your hand up? Just raise your hand up. God bless. Anybody else? God bless.
God bless each one. Now, all of you that have raised your hand, if you would, please, I want you to stand to your feet, and I'm going to lead you in a prayer of commitment. Just stand up. Everyone that raised your hand, even if you did not raise your hand, stand up, and I'm going to lead you in this prayer. Just stand up. You want to get right with God? You want to know you're ready to meet the Lord? You want Him to forgive you of your sin? I'm going to lead you in a prayer where you're calling out to Him. Just stand up. By the way, others are standing. You won't be alone. Anybody else? Stand now. Stand to your feet. You want to make this commitment or recommitment to Jesus? Stand up. God bless you that are standing. I'll wait one final moment. God bless you. Anybody else? Stand now. God bless you. God's speaking to your heart. Respond. The Bible says if you can hear his voice, don't harden your heart. God bless you. Anybody else? One last moment. God bless you. Anybody else? Stand now and we'll pray together. God bless you. God bless all of you. All right, I'm going to lead you in a prayer and I want you to pray this prayer out loud after me. This is where you're asking God to forgive you of your sin. You're asking Jesus to be your Savior and Lord. Pray this prayer out loud right where you stand. Okay, pray this after me now. Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. But I know that you're a Savior who died on the cross for me. I'm sorry for my sin. I turn from it now. I choose to follow you from this moment forward. Thank you for calling me and accepting me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless all of you that prayed that prayer. Let's welcome them. Yes, God.